Okay, so this is the last installment uh, for our seminar, and we're going to be looking at uh, the lesson plan, evaluating the lesson plan. Uh, I think this is a this is critical. Uh, it's sort of like if you're a preacher, you know, sermon notes. If you're type of person that that uses notes, I mean, generally you're creating notes uh, in one form or another as you you compile all the uh, resource material and study study the passage in front of you. Uh, but whether or not you actually use that those notes, you know, to guide you, and many people do, of course, uh, in the delivery of your message. Uh, but here, when we're talking about in the classroom, kind of a classroom ex experience or, t you know, teaching proper, um, you should have a lesson plan. I mean, you need to know what your aims are, uh, you know, for example, just understanding what the text is, uh, is a separate issue from... Uh, the aim or the direction, uh, what, what portion uh, of your study do you want to include in your class time, in, in your lesson, or are you just going to, you know, kind of dump all the information out there for them to, your students to sort through. So the lesson plan is critical because it addresses all the various aspects of a lesson besides the content. Be the content, the delivery, the specific objectives, the types of, of objectives that you would have, uh, the types of outcomes that you desire uh, for your students. So we're going to look a little bit at this, first of all, like a three-stage approach uh, to the lesson. Really, really simple. Uh, you know, you retain this in your mind that you're going to tell them what you're going to tell them, then you're going to tell them, then you're going to tell them what you told them. There's nothing original with that that's been around for a long time. So it's like preview, view, review. Let me tell you, you know, overall, so here's it, basically number one could be a an introduction and number three could be a conclusion. And right there in the middle is the basic body uh, of the lesson pro proper. So, so here's the preview. And in that preview can be all the uh, kind of um, stimulating ways that you want to draw them into that particular lesson you know why they need this you know what's what's the hook you know that pulls them in as we'll see later um, so you tell them what you're going to tell them you tell them then you tell them what you told them so before you just jump right into the lesson have you laid the foundation for it that'd be the preview and when you conclude do you just abruptly end and out the door or is there uh, some meaningful way that you can connect all the dots and sort of resolve the plot, if you will, of what you've been trying to tell them? You want to be sure when they leave that they leave with something, but be sure that that something that they leave with or that you leave them with is what you intend to. You, know, you want to leave them with confusion or frustration. Okay. Um, advantages of the lesson plan then. One is that it allows you to sufficiently prepare because you go over all the various aspects of the class, what's going to go on in that classroom from the teacher side of it or from the preacher side of it in the congregation to anticipated outcomes, uh, how exactly you are going to construct that uh, uh, material and which are you going to choose and for what purpose, and you have a good understanding of the students in the classroom as well. Uh, for example, you adapt it to specific spiritual needs of individual class members, but if you don't know them, then how can you adapt it? You're, you're sort of just throwing out these uh, generalized statements, you know, or, or just theorizing about a bunch of things. And meanwhile, they might sit there, uh, many of them having tremendous issues going on in their life, and really desperate for some kind of help. So the greater uh, your knowledge of your individual class members or those in your congregation, the better you're able to adapt the message. Of course, of course, you know, you have to be uh, very careful about this. If you're aware of some pretty intimate details that people might have, some personal issues that you're going through, you've been counseling them, things that they shared to you confidentially, even if you remove their name and you just throw that incident out there as though, wow, they'll be able to make that connection with this passage, they're going to feel betrayed, you know, to a certain extent hurt and may, may never see them again. So you do have to be careful with this, but you want to know in general the overall spiritual health 
and spiritual climate of that classroom. Uh, three, uh, content, content, sorry, <laughs> content adapted to the style of delivery uh, preferred by the students. Now, you may have a pref preferred style of delivery, but that may not be the preferred style of delivery for your students in the classroom or for those in the congregation. Uh, so you have to be thinking, how can I interest them? How can I sort of bring them out? How can I get them to engage this, this material? We all have our personalities, you know, we all have our style, but it also can be age group wise. And uh, some things that we can do can either turn off, like if I'm an older person, I could easily turn off or bore somebody who's younger because I, I can't quite relate or connect. Could be just the way I dress or the way I talk or my vocabulary. Or if you're a young person with older people, they can feel like, like you don't understand their situation. Some things that you say might be uh, confused as being inappropriate or something. Uh, but, but yeah. You, you have to adapt that. Uh, you have to be able to uh, do what will best result in communication. Not, not just information going out, but uh, you've encoded it in such a way that the person then who is the respondent, the recipient of this message, decodes it, understands it, and through discussion in the class and such, you can have a significant amount of feedback until that, that crystal clear truth comes out that's transformative for their life. There's greater liberty in teaching, uh, being freed from, you know, kind of a manual uh, textual style. What I mean by that is if you're just staring at your notes all the time and reading from your notes or worse yet, it's like it's like this. Right. So in front of me, what if I just read the PowerPoint and went on to the next one? You know, so you have to be able to sort of use these bullet points and even maybe even just have them in your mind as signposts, you know, these bullet points, but you've done the sufficient study and prep work so that you can be free of just locked in and your eyes locked in and focused on, uh, you know, some people want to be so verbally correct that they read their messages because they've got little interesting turns of phrases and things that on paper, uh, and in isolation from the, the students or from the congregation seemed, wow, that'll be such a great moment when I say that. Won't they be amazed? And you find out it's rather flat, you know, when you're actually saying that. So the key is, is to liberate yourself, you know, from these, these notes and uh, this manual approach. Also, uh, five, um, your lesson plan can be retained uh, for future opportunities. You know, it's not just a one and done. Class participation is built into the lesson plan. How are they going to be involved? Or, you know, even, even with a congregation and preaching a message, how are you going to engage them? What kind of involvement? And it could be just something as simple as you're, you, you, if you're the type of person that stands behind the pulpit, has the notes in front of you, is virtually reading their notes, uh, and making precious little eye contact, you're going to lose folks pretty quickly. And so even if the, the engagement is not so much, it's still kind of a monologue, but there's the use of rhetorical questions. You know, like, like how does that make you feel today? You know, what's happening in, in your life today? Have you experienced that these rhetorical questions, what makes them think now? And then if you step away from behind the pulpit, and you, you sort of move out to the edge of the platform to one side and you're looking people in the eye and you're using your, your, your hands and you're reaching out to them. Um, you're, you're attempting to identify with them and you move to the other side. And there's, 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 there's this, it, it just makes the delivery so much more authentic and as though you recognize they're in the room. It's not just you imparting information, but it's all about them. Uh, the lesson names, number seven, are identified and they drive the lesson flow because you've predetermined. You don't get distracted on something and start going this direction and this direction because this is so fascinating to you that you're uncovering every rock and every pebble and looking behind every bush, so to speak, uh, of the details. You get lost in the details. But instead, you have very, very specific aims. This is what we want to accomplish. 
And so all the different parts of that lesson all converge onto those aims. So you could come to the conclusion, let's see, I, I told them what I was going to tell them, and hey, I stuck to it, I told them, and then I told them what I, yeah, I tell them what I told them in the conclusion, and can you honestly say that you did? So you want to be able to come to that conclusion and say, um, you know, you didn't get off track, you didn't run down some rabbit trail, and you honestly know that the, the truth or truths that you wanted to communicate were in fact delivered to them because you, you, you studied it, you understood it, you explained it, you applied it, and you illustrated. And you say, well, job done. And you came to that conclusion and say, look, this is what we set out to do. And we did it. And now you can pray that there's some results from it. And then you want these results to be cumulative. So if you're preaching a series, you'd like to sort of step back and say, this is what we want. And block by block, you're building a foundation uh, for those students in your class and for your congregation. Then eight, the completed and followed plan can be revised. Ooh, there you go. And you revise it. And, and sometimes what works for one group, this might be a totally different group that you're speaking to. And so you can revise it or, or maybe just based on feedback. We'll talk about assessment in a few minutes. But, but maybe just based on the feedback, you see, yeah, yeah, yeah. That illustration, hmm, I, I could tell I lost it. <laughs> I lost it on them. They, they were gone. They did, they, or, or, or it was a good illustration, but they remembered that. The trouble is it didn't link to the application whatsoever. It was just a good story. You know, see, all, all those types of things. It's all, it's all valid. Don't, don't ever feel bad because there, there's some uh, feedback and an opportunity to uh, improve. So let's look at this, adapting the aim, number one. So imagine you open up a Word doc, whatever you're going to use, uh, and you begin, or even these digital pencils are pretty cool now because you can just, just scribble things out on there, all your conceptual ideas. And sometimes just drawing some circles and connecting them together or arrows together in boxes. You might be that type of a person. That's all you need is your iPad there uh, with with letters and boxes that you're signposting the big points, you know, and how they how your whole thing flows. It's like s storyboarding. Maybe you just do that. Just draw it out. Just just draw it out. Draw it. Here, here's your storyboard, and then you stick to that. Maybe that's your way of, of freeing your, yourself up for the presentation. But uh, there's adapting the aim, number one. So you have to know, uh, basically, let's just call it this, a needs-based approach. Uh, so ask uh, these questions, of course, rhetorically, but analytically of your students. You know, so here's a lesson. There's intellectual, emotional, and volitional because we're tripartite beings as human beings. We think, we feel, and we do. So we're concerned not only with the cognitive, but the uh, behavioral as well as the emotional. So w w what do I want my students to know from this book? All the stuff that we could possibly, what, what do I want them to know? And then what do I want them to feel? feel, what do I want them to do? And so your lesson objectives or aims revolve around uh, who the person is, right? Because we're thinking, feeling, doing people. We don't want a lesson that's just all thinking. We don't want a lesson that's just all emotion. Um, and we don't want a lesson that basically just demands people, barks out rules and demands things of people that you, you, you haven't explained to them why this and what this really is and why it's important. You haven't moved them to the point where they feel um, a certain desire and urgency about the significance of this truth to their life. Uh, readying the resource. This is another thing. So you take out this Word doc or take whatever and you say, I'm going to develop a lesson. But now I could give you one. I could give you a format, but you can do it easily yourself. You know, here, here's the text. Here's the date. Uh, here's here's how I'm going to introduce it. You know, you put that in there. And these are the aims. You know, this this is the the um, concerning uh, the intellect and thinking concerning the heart and the feeling and the hands and the doing and those things. And you and you just put them very simply uh, in there. Uh, then then readying the resources. What what kind of resources are you going to need 
uh, besides the classroom or the pulpit, what are you going to need? And so most of these things are technical and logistical. Uh, I mean, for the actual instruction, we talked about Logos software and, you know, all, all these types of things, uh, great websites, great commentaries and all these things that you could draw from to study the text. But how about the actual, you know, here's the, here's the lesson part of the plan is now, what resources am I going to need or, or use? You know, and, you know, back a uh, hundred years ago, you had everything from uh, flip maps in the classroom to, to chalkboards, right? All, all the sort of analog stuff. But now, now for the most part, it's, um, it's a digital world. So you have to be sure you've got all the media set up, all the media that you're going to need, the media, you know, the, the stuff that's prepared. And listen, listen, listen. So you're not a PowerPoint whiz. Let's say you're not. You don't have all the bells and whistles. Don't make it all about cute transitions and, and, and all that stuff. Because why? People will just be fascinated with the cool graphics and everything. And you, you should be more interested. Did they get the lesson? Now, it's neat if you can do the both. You know, if you're skilled and, and you can do that. But you don't, you don't want the technology to take away from... Uh, the, the, the power of the lesson. It can support the power of the lesson. I mean, imagine you're, you're teaching along and then you can actually take somebody by video instead of a flat map or graphic. You take them by video to the shores of Galilee. This is where Jesus and his disciples would have set out in, in this boat and so on. Uh, so uh, just, just as a logistical thing, Right, so the day of the class, the day of the event, the day that you're going to prepare, the day that you're going to speak, um, be sure you know everything from the microphone to the video to the power, all these things. Cause you, you know, a million things can go wrong, and then when they do, don't panic. I mean, be sure you've got it all up here. Worst case scenario, none of the technology works, and it's just you. It's just you and the word, the spirit of God, and your great preparation, okay? So don't make it all dependent on the technology, but if you're using the technology, be sure. Be sure you're comfortable with it. Be sure you've done it. I can't tell you how many um, events I've, I've spoken at different uh, churches and places, and they have said, oh, be sure you bring a PowerPoint. Oh, this, all that. If I had relied on that, uh, because it would have been a disaster. I had to have it here. I couldn't have it just on the device or here. And, and the reason is because um, even the best of, of churches with the best of staff, oh, well, our guy that usually does the AV, he couldn't show up today. So here, here's Brother Stone's going to try to do his best, but, you know, oh, it, it, it didn't work. So I'm just saying, you don't need that distraction. Can you imagine you've, you've, you've prayed for that class and those students and you've, You've prayed over the text. You've prayed over um, y y your studying process, you know, all of that throughout the week, only to get there in class day and feel you're totally a failure because uh, the computer wouldn't sync with your iPad or, or you, 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 you had queued up a, a YouTube video and it, and it wouldn't play or the audio started doing a bunch of feedback. Or <laughs> so just to say... Don't make it all about the technology. Now, you may, um, having said that, there's some wonderful things that you can do, right? So that's great. Let's do that. Um, there's streaming. Uh, there's streaming media. You know, and even most of the iPad, you know, iPad types of things, you can whiteboard on them and do do a lot of things. Of course, it's I'm talking preaching, but you, you know, I mean, I when I when I'm speaking, I've got a, a 70 inch television set next to me. Uh, with a graphic on it, or if I want, I can I can flip through different graphics or charts or, or whatever's needed. Uh, so just, just all kinds of cool things that we can do today. Streaming media as well. Uh, this this sometimes can be a hassle, you know. If if you're you know making all those connections between uh, uh, your your mixer and and your splitting uh, your, your your signals and trying to go in different directions from the camera to the uh, computer. Uh, then to, to upload, <laughs> upload online and all this stuff. But, but when, when it's done, when it's set up, uh, it can be really, really effective, you know? Because it's not just the classroom. It's not just that congregation. Now you're streaming out there to other people who can consume 
what you are giving them. And then if you're making video, of course, you've got all the post-production uh, possibilities. I'm not suggesting that everyone has to be all up on this, but, you know, it, it is helpful. Like, like if you want to preserve this, let's say, we, the wonderful opportunity of doing this. We can preserve this and archive all this great stuff in video. We can chop it up into smaller bite-sized sections. You can create um, YouTube channels and archives and, and all these ways that people can consume, you know, can can use, subscribe, and use this stuff. How about stimulating the students? Well, you know, you don't do that with an electric prod, but how do you, how do you get them um, excited about the lesson? And so there are uh, a number of ways um, to do this, actually. Um, I mean, one would be, uh, you know, discussions and classroom discussions, of course, it's so obvious. But even those discussions have to be controlled. I, I, I know I've had uh, here at our, our church, you know, we do a Friday night, uh, uh, invite people in, you know, kind of, it's sort of discussion, but then it's not. You know, it's basically I will present the material and then there'll be some time after. Uh, you know, it, it just can be a problem sometimes controlling. Uh, if, if I'll say it this way. If you have content and a limited amount of time. You either have to, if you're gonna use discussion, cut way back on the content or introduce the content during the discussion because what happens is you'll only get about three, five minutes of your uh, content out there before all the questions and the back and forth and so on, so on, so on, and pretty soon your time is gone and so are your good intentions for a lesson. But nonetheless, uh, you can use discussion and use it effectively, but I say controlled discussion. Uh, and it helps steer the uh, teacher away from just uh, pure lecture. And again, if you're preaching, this is more in the form of, of rhetorical style. You know, it's a form of persuasion um, by which you engage the student, but not in the sense of they, them directly responding but them uh, uh, thinking through this rhetorical question that you've thrown out there. So there's a range of questions. It can be re rhetorical, again, as I've mentioned, th theoretical, more, more concerned with the concept of something or personal as related to the individual or, or hypothetical kind of what if, what, what if experimental basically says, how, how do you think, you know, this would work out in your life? Like if you were to try this in your life, what type of experience uh, would be um, derived from this, whether it's negative or positive? Uh, biblical questions based on you know, um, does the Bible speak of this uh, some other place than this particular text? Uh, theological questions can have to do with how does this impact our understanding of salvation, and so on. Uh, applicational questions is um, how can this truth be applied to your life? And you, be, you, you sort of, instead of you giving them the application all the time, they make some suggestions. They say, you know, you know where this would really work in my life. I've just been struggling in this area, but now what you've said is so important. Um, then uh, contacting the class is another thing. So I know we're talking now, not so much, but this can be also with uh, the congregation, but also in, in the classroom. I mean, why is this important? All right, so we have social media, and I'm just throwing out things like you know, either private messaging somebody or texting somebody or Facebook or whatever. This is pretty simple, right? It's pretty obvious. But I guess what I'm saying is stay in contact, right? Because a, a pastor or a teacher isn't someone that just pops in behind the, the pulpit or behind the um, uh, uh, speaker's stand and delivers and then leaves never to see them again. And sometimes the best, uh, the best classes really are those where the teacher takes some, and the pastor takes some active sort of step to engage the students, to want to know about their life, their family, uh, what they're going through, what they're, what they're struggling with. Um, and that's part of this. Stay, keep it, stay in contact, keep in contact uh, with the class early and, and often. 
uh, preparing the presentation. And, and, you know, all this should be in the lesson plan. We're talking about a lesson plan. You know, for example, when you, when you say contact the class, is there a time during the week where you could say, I have been in contact? If you had if you had 100 members in a church and you said every week, I'd like to be in contact with 10 of them. You know, in 10 weeks, that covers all of them. And I don't mean only those, but I mean, I have a certain thing where I like to call them, I like to talk to them, I wanna meet somebody for coffee um, and, or, or, you know, some other activity. Sometimes it's a group activity if it's a men's group and you get five or six of them together at one time, then there you go. But you, 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 you make this part of the, of the lesson preparation, you know, in the plan. Um, it's strategically incorporated into the lesson. Uh, preparing the presentation, and so you're researching the text or the topic, you're organizing the data or the information, you're collecting all this stuff up to determine, you know, what, what's the big idea, what are the primary themes, what are the secondary themes, and then format the themes into an outline to guide the logical flow of the lesson plan. And it may be just too much for one lesson. So maybe a series, or or you just decide, I'm going to talk about, I'm, I'm going to approach this text from this angle, not from this angle, and disclaiming the fact to the class or to the congregation. I'm not attempting to exhaust every truth in this passage or chapter or paragraph or verse, but I just believe there is an important truth we can mine out of it that can be of use to our lives today. Uh, determine the possible modes of communication. Is it going to be a lecture? Are you going to, uh, and if it's a classroom, are you going to have some type of project or tasks that they work on? Maybe, maybe your series of messages is tied to some project or some initiative. Maybe it's a stewardship initiative in your church because you're building on something or there's a project to help um, relief uh, efforts in the Ukraine or uh, a number of things, okay? Uh, are, the, are you going to use object uh, lessons in the class? I, I did this for the longest time, many times. I, I'd always have something until people would, would look uh, in, in back of me when I come out for the uh, on the platform behind the pulpit and they'd be looking, where, where is it? What's he got this week? I'd have, I'd have everything from, well, I won't tell you, but I had lots of stuff on there. Uh, and it, it actually, people were wondering, how, how's he going to get that into the lesson? How's, how's that going to work? But object, object lessons can be, especially with kids, can be extremely fascinating. Or maybe you're going to demonstrate something. Here's a demonstration. Uh, how many times did I demonstrate faith to, to young children simply by saying, um, listen, to, could I have somebody um, who, who wants to do faith, show a demonstration to the rest of everybody about faith. So they're going to stand there very simple, right, and fall backwards. They're going to fall backwards, I'm going to catch him. But you can't, you can't put your leg back, something like, like that. You just have to fall back, I'll catch you. Then you go through two or three. And the, the kids, it was like, they, they just didn't, they, they wouldn't trust, they wouldn't trust. And I can remember one, one little girl saying, Pastor, I, I want to trust, I want to trust, you know, and came up and just fell back uh, perfectly. I mean, it's a silly kind of thing, but I'm just saying there are ways to demonstrate. I can remember preaching on uh, Hebrews chapter 12, therefore, you know, being surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside um, every, every garment, you know, lay aside every garment and the sin which uh, so easily trips us up to, you know, just paraphrase it. And I remember having one of the young, we were was playing uh, church softball at that point. We had a really good team, and I brought our shortstop up there. And I said, hey, uh, you want to be part of a demonstration? Of course, he already was because I brought him up, right? I, I tied his ankles together with some, you know, kind of clothesline material, tied them together. And I said, no, nah, I just need you to, to, uh, to move to that side of the auditorium. And so he had options, right? He could just drop and crawl on all fours, or he could hop or something like that. And it was kind of silly, and he, thankfully he didn't get upset. But it was kind of silly, but yet it, what did it demonstrate? I said, this is what we do spiritually in the Christian life when we're all tripped up by sin. You know, we're, we're just hopping around. We're, ju we're just a, a, a shallow, shallow vestige of all the potential that we have because sin is just tripping us up. Um, okay, involving the individuals, right? This is really significant, you know. Um, so the class activities are so integral because you want 
people to be uh, engaged with the material you want them involved. So, you know, discussion's okay, but we think of psychomotor stuff, you know, how the actual use of the hands or things that you do, actually, actually doing something physically or, or um, uh, participating uh, in some uh, active way, okay, other, other than, let's say, just talking, um, more hands-on, you know, type of skills. It doesn't just have to be children. It can be adults as well. But the key to the classroom activities, whether verbal, physical, is involvement. We want people involved. If you engage with the class content, uh, you're going to demonstrate your interest in it. Or if you're not interested and then you engage in the content with some kind of activity, all of a sudden you find, hey, this is kind of interesting. I, you know, I didn't think this was going to be interesting. But this is rather interesting. The psychomotor stuff starts at the very base with things like imitation. You know, just, just imitate. So if you're looking at something from the life of Christ, can we, can we imitate him? Can we I imitate that there's manipulation or actions performed through memorization or following directions? You know, how, how, how much memorization should be involved? So you use all kinds of devices, but from week to week with your sermons or with your... Um, uh, presentations in the classroom, uh, how much of that do you want them to retain, you know, going forward? And, and memorization, simple things to, to memorize along the way. Or precision is just, you know, you keep making this harder and harder, right? Because just watching and doing, now memorizing is a little bit harder. Precision, uh, where the performance comes more exact, uh, actions more precise you become more specific now as far as the intention a less general articulation several skills uh, performed together you know so, so now it's multiple things converging all at once naturalization is you you, you have now achieved what the desired outcome of learning experiences uh, is and that would be it becomes second nature to you. You've habituated it. And so you start by having, having a series of, of um, classes on overcoming anger and people that are having difficulty with anger and the bitterness and envy and jealousy that all goes with it, but the anger. Um, and you can imagine coming to the point where all of the various stimuli in your life that would otherwise have produced anger now don't seem to do that anymore because you've habituated all of these sort of practices of of humility of of love for others and things like this to where uh, uh anger really has a tough time breathing because you've taken all the oxygen out of the room uh evaluating the experience then if you ask for feedback sincere constructive feedback uh, maybe a, a survey you could put together um, some measure to assess teaching style, you know, like teaching style, how you're teaching. Is that, is that something that um, the students like? Same thing with, with preaching. Is this something, instead of just saying, well, I'm the preacher, that's my style, that's what I do. But what if somebody said, um, you know, uh, our, our, uh, you, you seem to be too stationary, you know, and, and you know, maybe you could move around or something, or, or some people move around, but they move around so much it becomes distracting. People can't even look at the uh, up there on the platform. But you need to go through that uh, content, effectiveness of activities. Do you like these activities? Do you not? Maybe the maybe you want to take the class outside and and do something like that. Maybe maybe you want to do a a classroom that instead of in the building is out on some hike, you know, on a mountain or horseback ride or, or something of people like out, outdoors types of activities. Um, but all these suggestions as to how to uh, improve the class. So you have Survey Monkey, for example, you can use something like that and develop it. People can uh, participate. And then avoid discouragement. If, you know, if you faithfully um, studied, understood, explained, applied, illustrated the lesson, be encouraged. You know, you're going to always get negative feedback somewhere, but if it's constructive, it's good. But you might get unwarranted criticism. You might think, boy, I was just, I had such high hopes for that lesson or that, that message, and I just seemed so, so flat and the people unresponsive. 
Now remember Isaiah 55, 11, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose which I sent it. 1558 of 1 Corinthians, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I want to just uh, finish uh, with the teacher-learner process, or we could call it the teaching-learning process. So it is a process. It's an ongoing thing. It's a, a, a dynamic between the teacher and the learner and the process. Those, those three things engaging at the same time. So when you look at the teacher, what is the teacher what is the teacher really doing in to that classroom or the pastor that uh, preaching uh, encounter? Uh, what's well, your particular uh, philosophy in terms of your thinking, your worldview? All of that becomes clear. Your personality, uh, your way of presenting, your passion, uh, the purity of your life. In other words, um, are you just verbalizing things that you yourself don't practice? Um, you know, is there a sense where you're relying all on the the intellectual side or, uh, you know, and also, you know, is there known sin in your life? Um, are there things, and, and this, this becomes a real problem. You have people that are very, very gifted and try to get by on um, their personality alone because they're such a gregarious uh, maybe person or strong personality or they're just gifted intellectually but yet their personal life's a train wreck. So, you know, just purity can be absolutely huge. Uh, precept, you know, uh, uh, the actual uh, source of, of truth that you've put together. Are you, are you mindful of um, uh, the text and careful with the preparation of the text? So your preparation goes along with that. Um, and... Uh, you know, so how many times in the in Scripture do you read in word and in deed? In word and in deed. So precept would be, you know, in word. Are you faithful in giving out what the word says? Preparation would have to do with that. We just spend quite a, quite a bit of time just on the lesson plan to ensure that the preparation is there, that you're not just winging it, so to speak. Uh, performance has to do with you, you yourself. What what you what you bring but do you actually live what you teach okay you can, you can have if you're a pastor you're going to turn off people in droves if the person you are outside the pulpit is different from the person you are behind the pulpit uh priority uh priority and and purpose so the teacher who has the priorities in place will be reflected in their lifestyle uh, in terms of where does um, where do the students, where do the congregants, the parishioners, the church members, where do they rank in terms of your life? Uh, and so all of this is to say that you, you're devoted to God, but you're also passionate about uh, tr uh, transformative teaching, teaching that changes the lives of others. And so we've said teaching to change lives, right? Um, of course, uh, you have to have your priorities in order, you know, and that, that's God, that's your family, your spouse, your children, and then ministering to other people. The minute you, you start getting your priorities all out of whack is the minute you're going to lose uh, credibility uh, with those that you intend to teach. Teacher is much more than intellect. Teacher is much more than information. A teacher is the whole package, you know, all these things. And you're, you're purposeful about it. It's, it's clear. People, people uh, get it clearly when you teach and preach that this person uh, is, a, is a person on a mission. You know, that's your purpose. My personal mission to make Christ known verbally through my life through my message through my family through through our church body uh, what does a learner bring into it you know an inherent uh, deficiency you know they you have what they need to learn and so you're imparting this but they also bring in individual life 
and that is you meet them where they are, uh, instructional level. Uh, some people are new in the faith. Other people been around for a long time, but maybe have just gotten so used to calling it in. You know, so used to just, um, yeah, my goal today is to sit in the class or sit in the congregation and get fed intellectually so that I understand it, but really have lost sight of the total purpose of putting it into practice in your life. So, so challenging them, trying to trying to wake them up. Uh, but the instructional level can be different, you know, in a congregation. And, and, and uh, so you, you have to sort of modify vocabulary, modify concepts. Don't always be given illustrations that relate to maybe upper income folks, but maybe there's also uh, illustrations that uh, almost make noble uh, not having a lot or, or being uh, imp impoverished at times. Uh, and an incomparable, uh, in, in, incomparable look. Um, uh, th this, this idea um, that this uh, person needs to be directed towards Christ. I mean, that's what we mean by incomparable. It, it, it's, uh, I'm, I'm looking at it because it's not spelled right. <laughs> Sorry. But this is the idea. Um, at the end of the day, we give them a glimpse of the Savior. We give them a glimpse of who Jesus is, that they just would be fascinated by who Jesus is. Uh, taken in by the wonder of all that he is and the tremendous privilege that we have to follow him. Then there's the process. There's, of course, curriculum. That's all uh, the basic content of your, uh, of your educational experience. There's collaboration. Um, so if you put both teacher and, and student on this horizon, this collaborative horizon, um, you know, Let's have some give and take. Let's have some engagement. Let's, you know, I, let's, let's just come together on this and resolve together that I'm going to work hard to bring you what the Bible says. And together, we're going to work hard to, to apply that so that all of us as a unit, as a collaborative unit, uh, can move forward. And I think it's important in church life. Uh, you, you somehow have to reach out and interest the people. If you look at the circle here, you know, interest the people on the periphery to bring them in. Come on, folks, we gotta we gotta bring them in. So you get your little core group. Don't be just about the core group, but get out there. So so there is no more core group. The core group becomes this, and you get everybody involved, everybody contributing. And I don't mean just you know painting the building or a fence or fixing something. I, I mean, in the sense of the truth in the lesson. This is a collaborative process between teacher and those who are taught preacher and those uh, who receive the message that together we are all growing. We're all growing together. We're not leaving anyone behind. Um, and and uh, uh, the idea of contingency um, has to do with personal accountability. So... You know, uh, you can teach, but they're accountable at the end of the day. You know, you can't force people uh, to receive what you're what you're teaching. Uh, but they should know that, though. They should know. They should know that now we know. Now we're accountable, and a contribution uh, would be how does all this relate to the bigger picture? You know, the, the sort of the kingdom stuff. Sort of what is God doing in the world right now? How, how is it what we're doing in this location among these few people? How does this impact the broader picture of what God is doing in this generation um, in the world? Uh, the structure of the lesson then. Uh, so if you think of it in this way, hook, book, look, and took, where you have... The hook being the introduction, and we won't get it. Let's not get into the yellow so much there, but just to say that uh, in the introduction, you want to draw people in. What is it that you're going to do to draw people in? What's the big idea? 
I mean, what is it that you uh, uh, use in that introduction to capture their attention, to draw them effectively into the lesson, to make them sit on the edge of their seat and say, okay, okay, you got me. I, I, I'm here now. I'm listening. And then the book part would be the instruction of it, you know, the instruction of the uh, material, whatever your truth you're disclosing to them. The look would be the uh, illumination of that then, which you're expanding on it. You're bringing it to life. You're making it alive, not just some flat graphic on a page, but you're bringing it to life in their time. And then installation, we could say, took. So they're, so they're going to walk away with, with what? I mean, you, you want them to actually take, you, you've hooked them, you've introduced them to what Scripture says, they've looked into it, they've had the truth sort of brought to light. Uh, but now, uh, much more than just the understanding, you want them to take something with them. You want this truth to transform them in some way so I, I i hope uh just a few sessions like this i know it's not it's not you know earth shaking it's not um particularly um uh, new any of this but at least i think it's a framework that you can be challenged and say you know i'm going to um try to take some of these these uh tips and resources and put them to practice in a much better way for the glory of God.